Across the earth, creatures begin to sense secret signals, begin to move. There is change in the length of day and of night, in air temperature and weather, foreshadowing a great upheaval ahead. On a planet constantly in motion, swept by relentless seasonal change, life too must move in order to survive. Miracles of nature are about to unfold. Each summer, an extraordinary migration is fueled by millions of tiny eating machines. Gorging themselves on milkweed, they grow large enough for transformation from caterpillar into one of nature's most sublime creations, the monarch butterfly. Generation by generation, waves of monarch butterflies will migrate northward through the United States as far as southern Canada. As many as four generations are produced each summer. The fourth generation appears no different from those that preceded it, but it is. Instinct tells it not to mate, but to accumulate fuel urgently, loading nectar through a straw-like proboscis. This generation will live at least eight times longer than its predecessors, enabling it to complete the longest and greatest insect migration on Earth. Using prevailing winds when possible, they labor to cover about 100 miles a day. Escaping the northern winter, they navigate toward a place last visited by their great-great-grandparents. Converging from across two-thirds of North America, as many as half a billion sweep southward toward central Mexico on journeys of up to 2,500 miles. Only one in five survives the hazards of the long migration, but their numbers are so vast, a hundred million complete the journey, arriving each year in the same small patches of mountain forest that ensure their survival through winter. How something the size of a leaf can navigate across an entire continent to a place it has never been remains an unsolved mystery of nature. The return of the monarchs holds mystical significance. It is the Mexican celebration of the Day of the Dead. In cemeteries, villagers gather with incense and candles to welcome back the souls of departed loved ones. Because the arrival of the monarchs coincides with the Day of the Dead, many villagers believe the spirits of their loved ones are returning on the wings of butterflies. In the forest above the village, the last of the monarchs have arrived. 
Through the winter, they hang almost motionless in semi-dormancy. A single tree may be blanketed by tens of thousands, so many featherweight creatures, their combined mass can break the branches. Their winter homes are today protected reserves. But to local school children, they seem like magic forests. They will fly only when warm enough. A gentle breath is all it takes to trigger a cascade. As spring approaches, the northward migration must begin. It is time at last for this generation to mate. The females lead the great exodus, carrying their fertilized eggs toward the North American heartland, each carrying as well the secrets of how a distant future generation will find its way back and complete a migration as mysterious and wondrous as any on Earth. Of all nature's migrators, none travel farther or in greater number than birds. Their preparation is intense. The young of species like Canada geese must grow enough in summer to migrate with adults by autumn. Aviation fuel in the form of fat must be packed on to power the flight ahead. Some grow so heavy they can barely take off. But when ready, they grow restless and eager. Signals only they can decipher tell them when the weather and winds are most favorable. Signals that propel them irresistibly forward to join one of nature's greatest spectacles. Traveling mostly beyond our view, migratory birds have eluded our understanding since earliest times. Today, radar designed to track aircraft and weather has begun to peer into their rarely seen world. Researchers have confirmed that most small birds migrate at night and that many species save energy by riding storm winds and prevailing air currents. Radar studies have also disclosed flight speeds, travel routes, and flock sizes and reveal that birds migrate in greater numbers than previously thought over distances once unimagined. Five billion birds migrate each year from Europe 
deep into Africa, and similar throngs cross Asia and the Americas. To find their way, birds employ a remarkable array of techniques. Initially, instinct points them in the right direction. Where possible, they follow landmarks. Where there are no landmarks, they turn to compasses provided by nature. Many take their bearings from the sun's position. The billions of night flyers seem to orient to the sunset in the west as they set out. Night offers protection from predators and smoother, cooler air for easier flight. But somehow they must navigate through the dark. Like early pilots, they simply use the stars as a compass and fly toward familiar constellations. When clouds obscure the stars, an internal magnetic compass may guide them. Occasionally, the Earth's magnetic field is visible to us in auroras, but only in the polar skies at night. Some birds use a magnetically sensitive substance in their heads to detect the pattern of Earth's magnetic field and to follow it like a map in the sky. Equipped by nature with a remarkable array of navigational skills, using whichever best guides them moment to moment, birds are the master navigators of the animal kingdom. The cold, nutrient-rich waters of the northern Pacific provide an abundance of food for migrating sea mammals. But when winter approaches, many leave here and swim great distances to accomplish another common goal of migrations, to mate and give birth in places of safety and warmth. So strong is this compulsion, gray whales make the longest migration of any wild mammal, swimming non-stop day and night without feeding for up to two solid months, from as far north as the Arctic Ocean, 5,000 miles south to Mexico. They may navigate through dark and murky seawater using a primitive echolocation system. Like submarines, many whales beam out and receive echoing sounds that sketch acoustic images of the undersea terrain. Traveling near shore, greys sometimes spy on, perhaps to locate familiar coastal landmarks. They may maintain their bearings simply by keeping the sound of the surf to their left going south, to the right returning northward. Pregnant females lead the migration south in order to reach Mexico before giving birth. Unfortunately, the timing is not always perfect. LA County lifeguards were the first to reach the 13 foot long infant gray whale. Experts tell us it's a female and they think she's less than a week old because part of the umbilical cord is still attached. It's said the mother may have started south late, giving birth along the way to an orphan now badly dehydrated and malnourished. Rescue efforts are underway to bring the baby whale out of the water and transport her to an emergency care center at SeaWorld in San Diego, two hours away. I need to drive that truck as fast as I could, as fast as the truck would go, and I knew time was of the essence. And then the CHP would just zoom right on ahead, close off traffic, and 
let uh, this whale go on by. When I first saw the whale, I honestly didn't think that she was alive. We see animals like this all the time, and the majority of them come in and die very soon after or, or arrive dead. They name her JJ and begin round-the-clock care. They must quickly learn how to take the place of a mother whale. It was amazing. As soon as the warm milk reached her stomach, she calmed, as if she recognized that we were here to help her. She was still semi-comatose, and my assessment at the time that that animal had almost no chances of uh, surviving. She was in very bad shape. While JJ's fate resides in the hands of human keepers, most of the gray whale mothers had made it to the warm, protected lagoons of Baja, California before giving birth. The regularity of their migrations once made them easy prey for whalers. Now they are greeted like celebrities by adoring fans yearning to touch a real whale. Protective laws discourage boaters from approaching a whale, but no law prevents a whale from approaching a boat. Naturalist Sherry Bondi and her daughter are here for just such an encounter. My little girl, Sirenita, the little mermaid, has a very special connection to the whales. When I got out there, it was just like, whoa. One was coming straight for us, and I'm like, what's that whale doing? seem to really study us carefully. I often wonder what they're thinking about while they're gazing at us as I gaze at them. Most whales are shy and keep their distance, but a few are curious. Occasionally, a mother whale will bring her baby to the boats in what seems like an attempt to introduce it to the human visitors. Because of the protected nature of the lagoons, we don't have predators who prey on the baby whales. And they stay in the lagoons for about two months while the calves nurse, and they nurse all day long and all night long, and they grow very quickly. They can double in weight, the calves, from when they're born. They're about a ton when they're born and about 15 feet in length. The mothers start to teach them swimming skills and what I call swimming schools. They'll swim against the tide in order to strengthen their flippers to make the long migration north. I was really wishing I would touch a whale. I'm like, oh, I hope I touch him and all of a sudden my hand was really down. It was just a miracle. In late spring, when the calves are strong enough, their mothers will lead them on their first great voyage north to feast in the polar seas. One youngster has missed that first migration, but 14 months after her rescue, the orphaned calf JJ gorges on 500 pounds of seafood a day. Once nearly lost, she approaches adult size. She pushes against the northwest corner of her holding pen day after day seemingly eager to rejoin her own kind on their journey northward, unaware that such a rendezvous is now only two weeks away.
One of the most bizarre migrations in nature occurs on tiny Christmas Island, a thousand miles west of Australia in the Indian Ocean. Each year as the monsoons arrive, rainy season and lunar cycle combine to unleash the breeding urges of forest creatures that emerge like monsters in the night. A hundred million red crabs begin their annual march from woodland to sea to mate and spawn. human inhabitants miscalculated the location of their community, building it smack in the middle of the largest migration route. But the crabs are harmless, and the islanders adopted a strained but friendly relationship with their fellow residents. After a journey of up to three weeks, males reach the shore first, where they confront an obstacle course of jagged limestone cliffs, undercut by powerful seas. Nature itself can seem booby-trapped with hidden surprises. On terraces above the cliffs, the males prepare burrows as they await the females. When the females arrive a few days later, they promptly take baths to replenish moisture lost on the journey and perhaps to rinse away the grime of travel and enhance their feminine allure. When ready, they approach the burrows, where they are seized by the males in a mating embrace. After mating, the males will depart for the interior forests again, leaving the females in protective burrows as their now fertilized eggs develop. The females know precisely the right moment in the lunar cycle to amass at the sea's edge. The high tide of the last quarter moon is about to crest. Each carrying up to 100,000 eggs, the females head for the surf, where they discharge their eggs into the outgoing tide. 
The young will spend three weeks at sea as marine larvae before returning as baby crabs. But adults are no longer able to swim. The mothers risk their lives discharging their eggs. Those swept away will drown. The surviving females head back to the woodlands, leaving the fate of the next generation to the whims of the currents and the predators of the sea. On the plains of East Africa, migration holds the promise of life and the prospect of death. Here, life is a relentless confrontation between hunter and hunted. Yet survival is also determined by the seasons. Through the wet season, zebras and other grazers are sustained by rich grasses and abundant water. For them and the hitchhiking oxpecker birds, this is a time of plenty. But soon, drought will wither the plains, changing the lives of both predator and prey. For 200,000 zebras, it is time to begin their migration northward. At times, leading the Great Migration, zebras are joined by more than a million wildebeest. It is the largest migration of hoofed animals on Earth. The two species find safety in numbers and in mutual vigilance. The alarms of each alerting the other to the presence of predators. There is another kind of threat. Range fires race across the tinder dry plains, a signal that drought has parched the land. Thirst becomes a driving force. The herds will risk drinking even from pools where crocodiles wait. The wary zebras remain on high alert, but a young wildebeest does not sense danger's approach. Reaching the northern grasslands, the herds confront the unrelenting reality of Africa. There is no safe haven. It is very rare for a hyena to attack an adult zebra. Foals are easier. A mother is lured away to a defensive position, unaware that other hyenas approach from behind. The father races to the scene. One 
very lucky foal will live on. Others are not so fortunate. For those whose existence depends not on grass but meat, zebras are a river of passing food, a guarantee of their own survival in a harsh world. Many are lost, but those that survive will grow strong and one day will race across the African plains in the great migrations to come. Sharing these grasslands with the migrating herds are grazing animals whose history has followed a different path. Their story is closely linked to that of another species that arose here. Once seasonal migrators, following the herds they hunted, some humans in Africa long ago turned instead to the herding of domesticated animals. No longer compelled to pursue wild prey like zebras, they were able to establish settlements. Today, like countless humans elsewhere, the Maasai and Batoga people still lead their herds from protective corrals to pasture and back each day. Yet in the time machine of East Africa, there are still tribes who follow the seasons. The Hadza possess neither shelters nor livestock to restrict their movements. Employing simple tools and weapons, they choose instead to continue pursuing the wild herds. They are rare living remnants of the tribes who left these plains 100,000 years ago to embark on what would prove to be the greatest of all migrations. They were the ancestors of all modern humans. Their mastery of fire, weapons, tools, and clothing gave them the ability to survive almost anywhere, making possible a new kind of migration. Small bands of hunters would venture northward out of Africa into the world at large. They set out not on round-trip seasonal journeys, but on a one-way migration that has lasted 4,000 generations. A migration that would take them to the very ends of the earth. Then, in a geological eye blink, our species and our technology radically changed the face of the planet. Our blazing success has darkened the lives and blocked the journeys of many other species. But today, we have come to understand that our own existence is closely linked to that of the creatures around us. We turn from the hunters we once were to the protectors we are becoming. We cannot really hope to know most wild creatures in their worlds, but occasionally one animal crosses into our world and touches our hearts. The time has come for JJ to go home to rejoin her own kind as they embark on their migration northward.
Her story has become a media event, her plight a concern to millions. And now she is carried homeward as carefully as if she were one of our own. a single creature we come to know can stand for all the billions we cannot know. And in our concerns for one, we discover how much we treasure all. On tiny Christmas Island, millions of baby crabs are returning from the open ocean, fulfilling the purpose of their parents' migration. Now, they begin the first of their own great migrations, from the nursery of the sea to the home of their species in the forests above. In marshlands and lakes on every continent, in wave after wave of triumphant landings, billions of birds reach their journey's end at last. On a planet constantly in motion, Life, too, must move in order to survive. Season by season, creature by creature, miracle by miracle, the epic journeys continue. 